Well, good morning. I'm going to go ahead and get us started today. Welcome to the house of the Lord. If you are thankful and excited to be able to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, today, gathered together in the house of the Lord, would you let that be known by saying amen? amen. All right, good. You're, you're, you're awake and, and ready to go today. I like to hear that. So we, I have some announcements I want to share, but people are still coming in. So I'm just going to open this up in a word of prayer. We'll go ahead and do our song. I'll come back up here in a minute and share those things with you. But I just believe that the best way we can start this day off in, in, in worship is to seek the throne of God in the face of God in prayer. Friends, we, we need God desperately in our church. We need God desperately in our lives. We need God desperately in our nation, in our world. The only answer to these problems that we are facing is Jesus Christ. And so <clears throat> we're amiss if we go into anything without seeking God and asking for his help. So let's do that today. Father, we thank you, God, for loving us. You are so awesome. Father, we come to you as your children today. To lift high the name of Jesus and to worship you. God, we need you in this service. We need you in this moment. You already know all of the needs in this room. You know what we need today through this service better than we know what we need. God, we humble ourselves before you. We ask you to forgive us, to prepare our hearts right now for worship. We've come here to encounter and experience you. So Holy Spirit, move in this place. Touch our hearts. We pray all this today. In the great name, the name above all names, the name of Jesus. And all God's people said. Amen. Guys, come on up and lead us. Good morning. What a joy to see you with us. Please stand as we begin our worship. We're going to sing glory to his name.
being seated, I want to share with you a couple things. Uh, we put some more of these out on the seats today. If you don't have one of these, I want you to, to grab one. We have some on your way out by the door. Uh, these are your invitation and your reminder of the revival that starts next Sunday, September 19th. Right here in this room at 1030, we're going to have a fantastic time. And we'll have things going on all week long. And I want you to make sure you keep this, use it as a tool to be praying over the revival. Also, I want you to pass this out, pass these out to your neighbors, your friends, your family. This revival's for us, but it's also for our community. Uh, it's our prayer. People will be saved. People's hearts will be set back on fire for God. Uh, so everything you need to know uh, is right here. Now, there's also some things that aren't on here that I want to share with you. Um, I want you to know that on Monday night, we're going to have uh, Chick-fil-A brought in here, okay? And so we want you to be able to come. If, if you're having to come from work, we'll, we'll feed you. Uh, you can just grab a sandwich, some chips, a drink, and uh, eat that. Some of you, you might eat earlier. You can have that for an extra snack when you get here. So the services will start at 6.30 nightly, Sunday night through Wednesday night, 6.30 nightly, okay? And so we want to give every opportunity for you to come. So don't let food be an excuse if you're working. You leave work, leave work a little bit early. Um, I give you permission, get in trouble at work to come to this thing, okay? You get here, uh, get you a sandwich, eat it. We're going to have a good time. Let me just say this too. Um, I'm going to need some help. And so if you're, if you're going to be able and willing to help me with that Chick-fil-A uh, on, on Monday night, uh, after the service, just come and see me say, Pastor, I'd like to help with that. And then this week we'll figure out exactly how that's going to take place. So see me about that if you're able to help. That, the Chick-fil-A will be here You can as early as 545. And uh, so you'll have from 545 till the service starts to come to get something to eat. And uh, if you come later, you know, at 6.15, you'll have 15 minutes to hurry and eat it, all right? And so I want you to be here for that. Also, the Prophecy Conference is going to be taking place Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning from 10.30 to 11.30. You need to be here for that. It's going to be a time of great teaching where we're going to understand the things of God in terms of what is happening, what is to come, these last days that we're living in. Some of you are, uh, are not retired and are, and are working full time. Listen, here's what I would encourage you to do. If you haven't already done this, you need to tell your employer that you're going to be taking about an hour and a half lunch break every day. Now, I know you get a lunch break, so you laugh. I know you get a lunch break. And I know we prioritize so many things, okay? You need to do whatever you can to be here from 10.30 to 11.30 to take in this word that we're going to be receiving. So I hope you'll be here for that. Now, the last thing I want to share with you about the revival is the only way we're going to see, um, I believe, a powerful revival take place is if we continue to bathe this revival in prayer. We've been doing it now for a couple months. Wednesday nights, we gather here for prayer meetings every Wednesday at 6.30. If you're not coming to that, I encourage you to come. Even when the revival ends, we'll continue having those prayer meetings because we believe that prayer is what we are called to do and what we as a church needs and what this world needs. But I'm going to give you an opportunity this week and through the revival week to join me in, in praying through the week. And I want to share with you a, a verse of scripture, two verses out of 1 John chapter 5. In verse 14, here's what God's word says. This is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. Now, if that doesn't get you fired up to start praying, I don't know what will. God says, you come to me, you pray, you pray according to my will, and if you do so, I will hear you, and if I hear you, you know you're going to receive an answer from me. So what I've done, and what I encourage you to do, get out your smartphone if you have one, or make a note of this. I want you every day between now and through the revival to join me in praying at 514. 
at 514. I've already set an alarm. Young people, get your phone out right now. I'm not seeing you moving. Come on. If you got, I need, I'm not kidding, y'all. I'm serious about us praying. I'm afraid if you don't do it right now, you're not going to do it. You need to set an alarm for every single day to go off at 515. That could be five. I'm going to be doing it at 515 in the evening. Okay? And I encourage you to do that with me. 515, or excuse me, 514. Okay? Why? Because 1 John chapter 5, starting there in verse 14. And we're going to be praying. And I'd love for us as a church, imagine if we as a church, every day from now through the revival at 514, all of us stopped what we were doing and took a moment to pray for God's hand to fall upon this place. All right, so set that, set that alarm and join me in praying every day through, from now through the revival. I'm starting tonight praying for God's hand to be upon this. All right, if you're a guest with us, you're like, man, they've got a lot going on. I want to I want to address you. I want to say thank you for being here. My name's Brady Wood. I'm the pastor. We're going to continue to worship together. We believe God is doing a great work here at this church, and we just give him all honor, glory, and praise. I want you to stand with me as we stand. Actually, stay seated. <laughs> I almost forgot the offering. They, they tell me I can't be a Baptist preacher if I forget the offering. All right, so listen, I'm going to ask my ushers to come forward at this time. We'll take up the offering. As our ushers come forward, we do here take seriously giving because we believe giving is an act of worship. And as God has given to us and blessed us with so much, we want to give back. I'm going to ask Brother Ron Shannon, would you pray for the offering? Father, we come to you today. Thank you for the many blessings you've given us. Father, we thank you for the opportunity of giving back to you in a portion of what you've given us. Lord, we ask that you bless this offering. Bless each and every one that gives and the one that can. You have the Father bless them. Be with us and be with our pastor throughout the rest of this day. Amen. you're able as we continue worship this morning.
Gabby, for all that playing you did. I know the the Lord must receive those instrumentalists and their playing as great worship today. Love seeing young people serving and leading us. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 11. If you've not been with us, we've been studying through the Gospel of John together. And now we come to this crucial point in the Gospel, chapter 11. Here, in the next several weeks, it's going to take several weeks to get through chapter 11. It's a very lengthy chapter, and it's a significant chapter. When we get finished with it, I'm excited for what lies ahead. Because through the rest of the Gospel of John, starting in chapter 12, you may not realize this, but there's this significant portion from 12 all the way through the end that is dealing with one week, one week in the life of Jesus, the week of his crucifixion. And it's powerful. John gives us details and insight that none of the other Gospel writers give us in those chapters. Today, this is really a crucial point in the gospel as we are going to see the seventh and final sign that John records for us that Jesus does. And so as you're turning there, I want you to ponder and to think about the question, what do you do when you're on life support? What do you do when you're on life support? When areas of your life seem to be on life support, or maybe you would even consider them dead, what do you do? What can you do? When your marriage is only hanging on by a thread, what do you do? When your relationships within your family, a mother and a father towards a son or a daughter, when it's on life support. And maybe you would be here today and you'd say, well, that, that relationship, that's already gone. There's no returning from that. It's dead. What do you do? What do you do when the situations of your life look so bleak? Maybe it's in your career. And you're looking around, you're boxed in, it's really dark, it seems like th there, there is no life to be had in that situation. And you're just hanging on there by a thread, you're, you're there on life support. W what do you do? What can you do? Where do you turn? I'm convinced today that there's areas in our lives that if we were to be honest with ourselves, we would say, it doesn't look very good. Possibly you're in this room today and no one knows it, but your marriage, it doesn't look very good. Your spiritual life, it doesn't look very good. Your walk with God, it doesn't look very good. Is there an answer? Is there a way out? Is there a way to life? Even when, even yourself, you might say, that thing's gone. It's dead. It's buried. There's no reviving it. I want to show you, beginning today, that there is hope. In whatever situation, whatever circumstance you have. And so if you have found chapter 11 of the Gospel of John, we're going to read through verse 4. Well, we're going to read through verse 16. I know it's a lengthy, a lengthy passage, but if you're able, uh, I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able and willing. Please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. God's word says, Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. 
Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sister sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God. So that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved, you hear that? He loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then, after that, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you, and you're going there again? Aren't there 12 hours in a day, Jesus answered? If anyone walks during the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. He said this, and then he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way to wake him up. Then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will get well. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death, but they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Then Thomas, called twin or Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let's go too so that we may die with him. Father, we ask you to honor the reading of your word and that you would help us to see today that Jesus is the only answer. Jesus you are the answer to life's greatest problems. You're the answer to life's greatest need. Jesus, you're the one that revives. You're the one that resuscitates. You're the one that takes death and brings life. And God, there are those of us in this room today that there's an area of our life that's just simply hanging on life support. Jesus, Bring our hearts to you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This is the last sign we see in the Gospel of John. If you've been with us, you remember that John shares with us, unlike the other Gospels, signs. Signs are miracles with a message. And so he chooses these seven miracles that Jesus did, and he calls them signs because in those miracles, there's a message. So it's a sign. And so it began with Jesus turning water into wine. That is a very private sign miracle. Basically, the disciples and only a few others saw what Jesus did that day. Then Jesus healed an official's little boy. Who was sick, he himself was probably on life support. And yet Jesus, from a distance, he didn't even have to go and see him. From a distance, some 20 miles off, said, go, your son will live. And boom, his son was made well. And so time and distance doesn't have any stoppage power when it comes to Jesus. Jesus can do what Jesus wants to do. Then Jesus found a man at the pool of Bethesda, and there that pool was a pool where, where the, these crippled, these lame, these blind were at. And there was a lame man. He had been lame for 38 years. Jesus said, do you want to be made well? He said, yes. He said, then stand up, roll up your mat, and walk. And right then, that lame man came bounding to his feet. He wrapped up his mat, and he took off running down the streets. After this, Jesus there was there, and there was a crowd of 5, 000, at least 5,000 men. There was probably women and children included, and they needed something to eat. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Let me show you how I'm the bread of life. And he took a little boy's little lunch box of, of, of five little loaves of bread and two little sardine fish. And Jesus broke it supernaturally. He multiplied it, and he fed the whole multitude that day. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes after me will not hunger and thirst. 
Then Jesus sent his disciples off. They went across the sea. He was up on the mountain praying. There on the sea, a storm arose, and they were out a great distance. And all of a sudden, they looked up, and in the middle of the night, here came Jesus. And Jesus was walking on the water, performing this sign. He was saying, listen, I'm the one that's created everything. I defy the laws because I created the laws. The laws work for me. I don't work for the laws. Here he comes, walking on the water there to the disciples. Then, there's this great sign that Jesus performs, a sign that people had never seen anything like this ever happen before. It's recorded there was a man who was blind from birth. It wasn't that his, his eyesight deteriorated over time. He was born as a baby, blind from birth, and everybody knew it. Jesus came, he touched that man's eyes, and he could see. He's performing all these signs. And if you notice, these signs, they kind of keep building and building and building. And now this seventh sign miracle is the, the greatest of all leading up to when Jesus himself is resurrected from the dead. He, and so there's going to be kind of some spoilers in here, okay? This is a long chapter. You get to Jesus bringing Lazarus back to life here towards the end, but we're going to have to reference it throughout the next several messages. So, spoiler alert. Jesus has already told us, Lazarus is dead. And Jesus is going to raise him back to life. He is going to literally call Lazarus out from the grave. And he's going to come out bound and wrapped up. And he's going to walk out a man that was once dead, now alive. But when we dive into this, there is much for you and I to grab a hold of and to see that Jesus wants to grow our faith. He wants to grow our faith. He wants to set us free. He wants to revive us. He wants to get us off of life support, whatever life support you're on today. And Jesus can do it. He has already proven that he can do it. And so Lazarus has been sick. And his, he, his family with Mary and Martha, they're, they're close friends to Jesus. Jesus loves them, we read and we saw. And because that Lazarus is sick, the, the sisters send a messenger to Jesus. And, and you'll see it there in, in verse 3. They send a messenger that says, Lord, the one you love is sick. And so it's probably about a day's journey for this messenger to get to where Jesus is. And, and Jesus hears this message from the messenger. And in verse 4, Jesus tells the messenger, now take this message back to the sisters. Verse 4, he says, this sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Here's the first thing I want you to grab a hold of today. When life is unraveling, when it seems as if something in your life is on life support, maybe you would even say it is dead to you. What do you do? I believe God gives us the answer right here. When we see what Mary and Martha did, they did what we need to do. And what they did was very simple. In verse 3, they called upon Jesus. That's what they did. Whatever problems you have today, whatever issues that are going to arise this week, this month, this year, no matter what happens in this world, no matter what's going on in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your school, in your work, whatever is going on, even if it's health related or if it's spiritually related, no matter what it is, the answer is always the same. Call upon Jesus. Because Jesus is the only one that can turn it around for you. Jesus is the only one that can take something that is dead and bring it back to life. 
Now, friends, that's good news. Here's why. Because even if it is dead right now, even if that thing is dead right now, with Jesus, it doesn't have to stay dead. It doesn't. Because just like Lazarus, Jesus can say, this thing, this sickness, this issue, it doesn't have to end in death. Now, Jesus didn't say Lazarus was not going to die. He just said this sickness wasn't going to end in death. And so we know Jesus tells us Lazarus has died. But he's going to raise him back to life. Now, there's something interesting here that can kind of be a head-scratcher for us. When Jesus says this, he says that this is going to take place for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And then I want you to see what it says in verse 5. It says, Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now that's, that's kind of interesting. Because Lazarus is sick. But instead of Jesus leaving right that moment and going to where Lazarus was, God makes it clear to us that it was the will of God for the Son of God to stay where he was at for two more days. Now you say, well, well why did Jesus do this? The, 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 the sisters are going to ask the same types of questions. Jesus, if you had come, our brother wouldn't have died. Jesus, why would you do this? Why would you allow us to go through such a thing? Why would you allow this thing to, to die? Why would you allow this to be on life support? Jesus, why do you do this? We need to understand today, Jesus never does anything out of cruel, cruelty towards us. He's not cruel towards us. He loves you. He loves me. What more evidence of the love of God do you need to know than John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that... Whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you so much that he came and he died on the cross for your sin. He loves you. He cares for you. And he says here in verse 5, he loves Lazarus. He loves Mary. He loves Martha. You might just need to hear it today, friend. So if you haven't heard the last couple minutes, hear it. Jesus loves you. He loves you. Say, well, why am I going through this then? Why am I going through this ordeal? Why is life turned upside down? Why is this thing in my life on life support? I can tell you that I don't have every answer to why, but here's what I do know. Jesus loves you. And you can trust him. Listen, we, we don't know why everything happens the way it happens. We don't know why evil happens in the world. We can't articulate and know exactly why on some of these things. But here's what we can know. Here's what we can know. Jesus loves you. He cares for you. He wants what's best for you. And when you look at this verse of scripture, Jesus does things for your good and for his glory. Every single time. Every single time. Jesus is working things out for your good and for his glory. And what Jesus is leading us to today, he is leading us to another level of trust and faith 
in him. That's what he's doing here in this story. The reason Jesus is waiting two days to go see Lazarus and to heal him is because he is taking this family's faith up another level. He is taking his disciples' belief in faith up another level. Jesus is concerned with your spiritual life. Jesus is concerned with your faith. You see it there in verse 15. What did he say? I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. He wasn't glad that Lazarus died. He was glad he wasn't there so you may believe. So that your faith could grow. So that your trust in him could grow. So that you could see God do something that only God can do. Sometimes you got your your life is in turmoil, your life is in trouble, and, and you're dealing with things because God wants to show you His might, His power, so that when you Standing on that foundation of Jesus Christ, the rock, and you say, my faith has grown and it has been strengthened. Jesus isn't leaving you and me as little infant babies in our Christian walk. Nobody in here wants to go back and be a little baby physically. You always wanted to grow. You always wanted to get older. You always wanted to get stronger. He's growing our belief and our faith and our trust in Him. He says, this thing is happening, and it's not going to end in death, but it is for my glory, and it's going to be for your good. There are purpose in God's delays. Delays are not God's way of getting at you. Did you, want, did you know that today? Delays aren't God's way of punishing you. They're not God's ways of sticking it to you. Delays always has a good purpose in it from God. Delays are always about God doing something for your good and for His glory. Oftentimes, these delays, there is pain involved. For, for Lazarus, for Mary and Martha, there's pain involved. There's emotional pain. There's physical pain that they're going through. God uses, He can even use pain to strengthen and to grow our faith, to bring about something good. See, pain oftentimes brings strength. Right? You work out. And you go through the pain of working out. And you've heard it said, no pain, no gain. Why? Because through the pain, you gain strength. God is strengthening our faith. We remember 20 years ago, yesterday, those tragic events of 9-11. The terrorists came and attacked our country, our land. And friend, they were attacking the Christian faith. So much pain was involved in the days, weeks, months years, even today, so much pain was involved in what took place that day. And we don't always have an answer for why does God, why did he allow such to happen? Why did God allow such a thing to happen? I can't give you the answers on those things. But what I can tell you is that even in that pain, God could take it and use it for something good and for his glory. And I believe as we watched television this last week and Friday and Saturday, and we saw the documentaries and all the things that went on around 9-11, it just becomes so crystal clear 
that even though this nation and we as a people in New York City especially went through so much pain, we saw so much good come. We saw a nation that was divided become united unlike it's ever been before in a long, long time. We saw a people that, that didn't care for their neighbors all of a sudden caring for one another regardless of what they looked like, regardless of where they had come from. We saw people have a new purpose in their life. When we saw men and women uh, find that calling and that purpose to, to, to serve our nation, to, to go overseas, to fight wars, and to be a part of our military. See, even in pain, God brings about strength. And friend, if you are experiencing pain right now, understand today that Jesus can bring strength to your faith coming out of that pain. One of the things happening when we go through these times of trial as Lazarus and his family is going through in this moment is not only do we experience pain, but we experience pressure. There's pressure upon our lives. That pressure is real. That pressure weighs down upon us. That pressure presses down in our minds. It presses down upon our bodies. It can bring about great stress, great tension, uh, great trial in our life. But did you know that, that some of the most beautiful things in the world, they, are, they come about from pressure? The diamond itself, we love the beautiful diamond. So many of the ladies in here have a diamond on their, their finger right now. You may have a diamond in, in, your, in your ear. You may be wearing a diamond around your neck. We love diamonds. They're, they're beautiful. They're, they're a precious stone. But that diamond, how is it formed? Well, it's formed underneath the earth's crust there in the mantle with the extreme heat and extreme pressure pressed down upon it. That causes the diamond to form. And it's out of that heat, it's out of that pressure that something beautiful and majestic comes forth. God allows us to go through times of difficulty he allows our life to be on life support because it's through that pressure, it's through that pain that it brings something beautiful out on the other side. Jesus don't, doesn't want you to stay where you're at in your walk with Him. He wants you to grow. He wants your faith to grow. He wants your trust to grow. He wants you to take steps of faithfulness. Friend, when's the last time that you took a step, a step of faithfulness for God? When's the last time that you heard the voice of God? You heard Him telling you something you needed to do. Some way in which you needed to surrender to Him. Maybe today you're here and it doesn't make any sense to you. But, 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 but for some reason, it's in your mind, it's in your heart, and it's coming from the Holy Spirit. And He's saying to you, surrender to me to full-time ministry. Surrender to me. To be a full-time mi missionary to go, to leave America and go to some other part of the, the world. To, to share the gospel. I said, would God do that? Would he do that? Yes, he, he, would, he would do that. He would do that. When's the last time you took that step? You listened and you said, okay, I'm going to surrender. Maybe you're here today and you've trusted Christ for salvation, but you've never made it public. 
for whatever reason, you, you've never come forward and said, I need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. If you have not followed the Lord in believer's baptism, you are not growing in your Christian faith. That is the first step for a Christian. It's to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. You're not going to grow very far if you don't take that step to say, I'm all in and I'm not ashamed. But from the pressure, from the pain, Jesus brings about something wonderful. I want to just close with a couple more thoughts. If you look at verse 7, it says, Then after that, he said to the disciples, Let's go to Judea again. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it. But we already read on down below that Jesus already knows Lazarus has died. And he tells them, he says, and he tells them plainly, guys, Lazarus is dead. And Jesus has stayed for two days. This very likely could be the timeline of what has gone on. When the messenger left Mary and Martha on his way to Jesus during that journey, Lazarus died. When, he tell, when he's telling Jesus about the sickness of Lazarus, Jesus then sends him on. He sends him on back. Jesus waits two days. It's four days later. Lazarus has been dead. Jesus knew that Lazarus was already dead. Most likely, he was already dead. We know Jesus knew Lazarus was going to die if he wasn't dead. Already. When the messenger got back to Mary and Martha with the message, and what was the message? The message was, this sickness will not end in death, but is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. When that messenger returned to them, he came there, and there was a dead Lazarus. And he shared the message Saying this was the message from the master. He said this will not end in death. And there Lazarus is lying. Dead. The question. Is it ever. Too late for Jesus. Is it ever too late for Jesus. That relationship to your child. Is it too late for Jesus to do something in it? Your marriage that's struggling right now. Maybe you have a friend or a family member that. The husband and wife have split. And it looks, it looks dead. Let me ask you. Is it ever too late for Jesus? Some of you in here, you have for years and years and years. Chosen to be disobedient to God. In what he has called you to do. You've been disobedient. You've been unwilling. To surrender your life to Christ for salvation. You've been unwilling. To follow the Lord in believers baptism. For years and years and years. You've been unwilling. To give sacrificially to the Lord. And maybe you're to the point now. Where you just think. Well it's just too late. I've waited so long. I've built up such a great wall now that, that, that this wall can't be torn down. Listen, it's never too late for Jesus. And he is showing us here in this passage of scripture that there is no circumstance 
There is no thing, there is no problem, there is no issue that it is too big for Jesus, then there's never a time that it's too late for Jesus. Friends, we need to do what Mary and Martha did for Lazarus. We need to go to the only one that has the answer, the only one who is the answer, the only one that can change this thing, the only one that can take death and bring about life. We need to call upon Jesus. And I'm talking to you individually today. I'm talking to you personally today. I'm talking to you as a family today. I'm talking to the men in here today. Men, it's time to step up and be the spiritual leader of your household. Maybe today's the day where you get your family and you say, we've been needing to do this for a long time. When the invitation's given, I'm taking them by the hand. We're coming down front and we're getting on our faces before God and we're praying. We're asking God to turn our family into something mighty for Him. To change us. It's never too late for Jesus. All we need to do is call to him and call upon him. What would you do today? What would you do if whatever issue in your life you're dealing with, you had this answer from Jesus? Listen to it again. This sickness will not end in death, but it's for the glory of God that Christ may be glorified through it. How would that change the way you call upon Jesus today? How would that change the way you live? How would that change the outlook of your life? Well, can I tell you something? Jesus has told us we can trust in him. In Romans 8, 28, he says, We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love him, those called according to his purpose. And that's a promise from God to you. He's given you that answer. He tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 9, listen to this. The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay. But is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Friend, there is purpose in the delay. And it's God's will that no one in this room perish. It's God's will that none of your family perish. It's God's will that none of your friends perish. It's God's will that none of your neighbors perish. It's God's will to bring about life and transformation into every single person's life. How does that impact you today? How does that change the way you think? How is that going to change the way you live? Friends, we have received the word of God today. Not so we can leave here with better intellectual knowledge. We've received the word of God today, friends. Not so that we can leave here better understanding this first part of the, of the historical account of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Friends, we have received the word of God today so that God can change our lives. And he wants to do it. He wants to do it. The question, though, are you going to call upon him? Are you going to humble yourself before God and say, I don't care what people think. Can I tell you something? Here in a moment, we're going to be given an invitation. You say, what's an invitation? Well, it's what God teaches us in the Bible. It's an opportunity for you to respond. It's an opportunity for you to respond. And, and, and I'll be standing out front. We'll, be sing, we'll all stand. We'll be singing together. David will lead us in that. And I'm going to be calling for you to come forward and to pray, to, to talk to me. To say, I come today, to I want to trust Jesus for salvation. I come today, I need to be baptized. I come today, I want to join this church. I come today, and I just need some prayer, Pastor. It's an opportunity for you to come. And friends, let me tell you something. Anyone that steps out of your row and you come forward, I want you to know, no one in this building is going to look at you negatively. We are, I'm going to rejoice. We're going to rejoice. 
If you come today and say, I want to follow the Lord in believers' baptism, we're going to rejoice. You say, we're, I'm joining the church today. We're going to rejoice. The Bible says when one sinner repents and is brought to the family of God, heaven rejoices. Friends, we'll rejoice today. But we've got to call upon the name of Jesus. Let's stand together. And as you're standing, I want to ask you to bow your heads. Father, we ask you through the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us to make decision today. God, help us not to leave here without being changed. If someone here is on some type of life support. May they be serious about calling out to you, Jesus. You are the only answer. Help us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please come as we sing. I'm standing here. Don't wait. Please come now. I have decided to follow decision or if you need to come pray while I'm sharing, you just come on. Don't, don't let me talk and stop you. This is an open time for you to respond, but I want to share this with you. Here's what 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 says. God's word says, and if my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I need revival, church. We need revival. 
Our community needs revival. Your family needs revival. Your neighbors need revival. This nation needs revival. God says it starts with us in this building. It starts with his people who are called by their by his name, if we will humble ourselves, if we will pray, if we will seek his face, and if we will turn from our sin and from our wickedness, God says, I will hear in heaven. I will forgive your iniquity. I will forgive your sin, and I will heal your land. Friends, we need it. There's no doubt about it. We're about to close. I'm going to ask at this time if you are a part of our church and you're willing, I'm asking you to do something. I want you to humble yourself. I want us to seek the face of God for this revival. If you're able and willing, I just want you to come up front. You can sit down on these front chairs. If you're a young person and you're willing to kneel down, come up here and kneel somewhere, join me. But I'm asking you to come. If, you, if you, we run out of chairs, I want you to just come stand up here. And we'll, I want us to take a moment. I want us to pray for the revival. So I believe in prayer. And if nobody comes, then I'll just kneel by myself. Father, we humble ourselves before your mighty hand. You are holy. You are awesome. You are glorious. You are good. And we thank you that you love us. God, we admit before you right now, we are sinful people. There's evil in our lives. There's evil in our community. There's evil in this world and in this nation. And God... We know that there is sin in us, even us right here in this church. God, we do not want to hinder revival taking place in our lives and in this community and in this nation. We seek your face. We call upon your name, King Jesus. We ask you to forgive us of our sin. God, restore us. God, ignite a fire in us. Lord, continue to humble us. God, we ask for you to be glorified in us and through us. Jesus, have your way through our revival. Have your way in our church. And God, we truly beg, not because we want to have some type of recognition, God. We want you to have all glory and honor and praise. We want people to see, God, that you are doing a mighty work. God, may that work start with us here at this church. May it touch other churches around us. God, may a revival take place in our community and nation. But God, we know it starts with us humbling ourselves and staying humble before you. So we bend our knee, we bow before you, God, humbling ourselves, asking you, Lord, to do what only you can do. Bring about healing. Bring forgiveness to our life. Give us grace and mercy, God. And Lord, may many people be saved through your work that you're going to do. May many people's faith be strengthened. May many people make decisions for you. Maybe somebody during our revival would surrender to the ministry. God, maybe somebody during the revival would be baptized right here during this revival week. God, may our altar be flooded in the week to come as we continue to seek your face. Jesus, it's all honor and glory to you, and it's in Christ's name that I pray, amen. Thank you for being here. We're dismissed.
Hey, Gus, so good to see you. So good to see you. Who's this little girl? Irvina. Uh-huh. Wow. 